What you're looking at in this text is the fact that the children of Israel in that time frame when Jesus was walking the earth wanted very much for the Romans to be gone. They didn't care how, they just wanted them to be gone. They were tired, very, very tired of, of Roman domination and uh, they, they did not want to have the Romans around anymore. So, I know that you've read this passage before, but you, you must, in your mind now, just spend a few seconds realizing what just happened, what passage he just read. Let's, let's review. Jesus tells his disciples to go and do what? Get a donkey. Uh, in fact, it's a, an unbroken, unbroken donkey. It's a colt that has never been ridden. Now, if you were a member of society in that day, you would know that, if you'd read your Bible, that this was the sign. This, this was going to now be the sign that this was the one. Because it was said that the, the one that would take David's place, David, of course, being the best king, uh, number one king. Who was the, really the number one king? Do we remember his name? Saul. Saul. Saul's number one king. And, and for all you Angelinos that work in the industry that says, you know, if you look better, therefore you are better. God actually decided to do a bit of that. He chose for the first king of Israel, a guy who's head and shoulders taller than everyone else. He is broad, he is good looking, and he is from one of the best tribes, the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe that, that has, has, problem, has no big, big huge problems in the past, and, and he makes him king. But we know the story of Saul, at least most of us do. If you don't, then it is your homework this afternoon to go and read the story of Saul. It is a sad story. Because halfway through his administration, God passes on the baton of being king of Israel to David. David is, is this runt. I, I know that that may be a, a strange thing to say. But he's the last. He's the, he's the kid. He's the kid brother. When Samuel comes to visit, he comes and he looks at all of the brothers of, of the, the sons of Jesse and he passes, God passes by Eliab, the oldest, right on down the line and, and he comes and says, do you have any more children, Jesse? Do you have another son? And Jesse says, yes, but he's out tending the sheep. They make him, they send a message with a servant and they make him come in and David comes in and the Bible says he was ruddy complected so all of you who need to know how you look in the morning thank you very much for having a, a, a mirror in your purse mommy that's very good okay you need to know how you look he was flushed because he had just run all the way in from the fields so David David comes in and <clears throat> God tells Samuel this is the one this is the one. And he takes him out back and he pulls out his horn and he anoints him the next king of Israel. The reason I, I bring all of that back to your attention is this. Because what were the people yelling when they saw Jesus on the donkey? Why did they go out into the fields and hack down tree branches and, and specifically palm palm branches. Why did, they, why did they do that? Why did they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Because you see, this was the, this was the zenith. This was the, the high point of the, the kings of Israel. And you say, but pastor, what, what, about, what about Solomon? Oh yeah, oh yeah, what, what about Solomon? Uh, yes, 
Yes, he did ask God for some good things and God gave him those good things like wisdom. And, and then he said, because you've asked for wisdom, I'll give you everything else. So Solomon like got his entire bucket list and then some. Yep. The then some just you know, fills up whole books. In fact, then at the end of his life, he sort of stamped his foot and said, you know what? All this then some that I have acquired, <laughs> I'm going to die. And some fool is going to inherit it. That's how he felt. Just read Ecclesiastes or read Lamentations and you'll find that out too. So he's riding on a donkey. Jesus is riding on a donkey and he's coming into Jerusalem. He's coming over the mountain from Bethany and he is now looking at Jerusalem. Some of you have been to Jerusalem. I have been to Jerusalem. And now in my mind's eye, we are on the other side of the Kidron Valley because you're on Mount of Olives. And then it goes down into this deep valley. It's pretty steep. Let me tell you, if you do the walk, you, you better have good shoes because the road is, is pretty steep. It goes down into the Kidron Valley and then up to Jerusalem, up to the city of Jerusalem. And, and so Jesus, Jesus is now coming to the brow of the hill and, and he's on this donkey. And, and he's, he's doing exactly, he's doing exactly what they said that the Messiah would do. And so you have his supporters and all those who had been looking forward to the Messiah of their dreams. Let me say that again. Looking forward to the Messiah of their dreams. Jesus is fulfilling every, every piece of the picture for them. They're very happy that he is. And so they are basically singing a na, nanny, na, nanny, na, nanny, na song to the Romans. Here it comes, dudes. This is the one. He, he is the one, and he is going to sit on the throne of his father, David. My friends, you will now make a discovery. This is why when Jesus died, the Romans put a sign on top of his cross. Remember what that sign said? It said it in three languages at least. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, now, we're the Romans. Bring anybody you think that's going to take us over. Bring them on. And this is what we will do to them. We'll crucify. Our favorite thing. Torture. It, 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 is, a torturous, it is a torturous thing for uh, a person to die on a cross. And, and something that we don't normally talk about with young children. You know, we, we as a country have decided that certain forms of torture are no longer legal. Not so the Romans. They perfected the art of killing people slowly so that it would be a deterrent for anyone else who would think to do whatever it was that the Romans had decided to crucify someone for. And so they used to line the streets outside of Jerusalem with people who had displeased them and they would leave them there until they suffocated to death. So it was strange when the centurion came to Jesus and he was already dead. That's why he asked his underling for a spear and he took that spear and he jammed it in Jesus' side and the Bible says blood and water flowed, so it was probably on his left side. He wanted to be sure that he was not faking, because what was he doing? He had a big hammer in his hand, and he was going around, and he was breaking the legs of the other people that had been crucified. So that they could no longer lift themselves up to take a breath, and that they would suffocate sooner. Because die they must, and, and they wanted them to die quicker, the the. Pharisees wanted them to die quickly so that they could be taken down off the cross because what? 
Oh my goodness, <laughs> it would be terrible. Sorry, I'm being too much of a valley girl. Okay, it would be so bad <laughs> for, for us to have, you know, one of our people being crucified by you guys up on the cross on Sabbath. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you guys are smiling, but I, I hope you're catching the incredible irony that it was more important to take somebody down off of the cross so that it would not look bad than to bother to think about why they had crucified him in the first place. Sabbath and Sabbath keeping the ritual was more important than the whole reason for the ritual and or the person who had in first, first made the Sabbath. I, I, I hope that sinks into your consciousness because of what is going to come next as we talk today. The text that was read this morning says that Jesus uh, goes uh, uh, and, and, and he finishes the procession into Jerusalem. The people probably coming with him, he goes into the temple and there's nothing happening because it's the time of day when whatever was happening in the temple has already been cleared out. And so he turns around and again, uh, when you come with me to Jerusalem, because I would love to lead a trip to Jerusalem sometime, and you see the hike that I am talking about, you are going to have a different picture of my Jesus. You are never going to think of him as a wimp again. You're never going to think of him as little Jesus meek and mild. You're going to think this dude, this dude had some serious cardiovascular capability. Okay, because just what we're going to say right now, where he leaves Jerusalem, goes back down the mountain and through the valley and then back up the other side and, and then over to Bethany, which is another three miles away. On foot, at night. This was normal. I mean, didn't have cars. Didn't have trams. Okay, so it, it just, just don't blow past some of these things sometimes because it, it really does impact the way that you think about our Lord and Savior who came and lived with humanity in the situation that he had created. Yes. He had called the people of God into existence through Abraham. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The next day, Jesus uh, gets up with his disciples and he moves into Bethany. He moves from Bethany. He's going to come back into Jerusalem. It's a festival weekend. He always stayed with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany. And it's a festival weekend, so he comes back. He's now finished sleeping. He gets up. And as was his custom because of how he lived. Remember, Jesus, Jesus lived in Stevenson Ranch, didn't he? Oh, oh no, no. He lived, he, he lived in, in Saugus, right? Uh, no. Jesus, when asked about where he lived, he said, Foxes have holes, birds have nests like the mockingbird outside my door at 3 o'clock in the morning. Birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I, I don't know about you, but already this morning, you have been given an opportunity to be Jesus. Did you know that? This church, every six weeks, offers people who are homeless a place to stay. The Bible says you don't know when you will entertain angels. So you might want to make sure that when the stranger comes around that you find a place for them because you don't know whether that stranger might be an angel who is uh, uh, traveling around like Jesus traveled around because he had no firm fixed address. Yeah, we, we have an opportunity. What, what do we call that? Family promise. If you don't know what family promise is, guys, I'm going to get myself a handheld here. It's going to be the red mic. Family promise. 
There we go. Family promise comes very shortly. And we have the opportunity to help out with that. Um, Chris says I always speak in parentheses. This is a quick parenthesis. In 2015, we were traveling to Austin, Texas. The short version is we hit a cow in Snyder, Texas at 60 miles an hour. Yeah, on a bridge in the middle of the city. And yes, the sheriff was there in 90 seconds after Chris called because he was looking for that cow. Well, we found it for him. And we punted it 50 feet in front of us and God saved us but he didn't save the cow. I'm sorry. But, but I'm just going to tell you, at that moment, we became homeless. Yes, we, we headed to a, a hotel, but there was nothing to get us out of Snyder the next day. It was Sunday. The God provided, like I said, that's a long story, and I'll tell you sometime, but I'm just going to tell you, in that moment with our possessions, which had been packed expertly <laughs> in the van we were homeless with those things these were this was what was going to take care of us for the two weeks when we went to pastor meetings and to general conference session and a nice lady used her Ford F-150 crew cab to take us one hour to Abilene She's an angel. She also happens to be the daughter of a lady who took her to Sabbath school when she was a little kid. And now she's the police, uh, what is that person that calls things out over the radio? Dispatcher, yeah. She's the police dispatcher in, in a little town in Texas. But she knew the Seventh-day Adventist Church and she knew who I was as a pastor. And without her glasses and without her shoes, she took us instead of the Greyhound bus. I'll never forget her. She's part of my journey now. When I was homeless, she was willing to take me to the place where I could rent a car. So we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know that Jesus is now up in the morning and he is ready to go into Jerusalem again. And he goes up to a fig tree for breakfast. Might as well have had a neon sign on it saying, Saugus Cafe Fig Tree. <laughs> okay. He goes and he parts the leaves of the fig tree looking for breakfast. And he doesn't find a single fig. He steps back from the tree and says, you know what? And he's talking to the tree. So if you think Jesus is crazy, this is proof. He did talk to trees, okay? You will never bear fruit again. And he walks away. He goes on into Jerusalem, and when he gets into Jerusalem, I don't know, it's morning time now, and he's into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple, and in the temple, there is a specific courtyard that has been delineated, and you can see it in the, in the old Herodian temple. You, there, there is a specific courtyard that has been designated the courtyard of the Gentiles. Now, forgive me for this, but I'm just going to say I no longer use the word or the hyphenated word non-Adventist. Smack me if I do. Because non-Adventist is our equivalent of the word Gentile. Because you see, if you were Israelite in those days, and, 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 it, and you saw yourself as the called of God, anybody who was not what you were was a Gentile. And in the temple, you could not go certain places inside the temple area if you were not an Israelite. They cordoned off a section and they said, all those who 
become Israelites, were Gentiles, you now have to worship over here. Yes, you can come and worship our God, but you have to worship over here. Now here's the kicker. Jesus didn't find a whole lot of Gentiles worshiping there that day. He found that the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council, had set up a market in the temple, in the section that had been delineated for Gentiles. Now, I'm not an Israelite. I would be considered a Gentile. So this would have been my place. If I had come to worship the God of Israel, this would have been my seat in the house. And instead of having a place in the house, it had been turned into a market for doves and sheep and other items of sacrificial worship which you had to purchase with temple currency. So not only was there money being made uh, by the purchase of so-called perfect animals, but there was also money being uh, ripped out of people's purses, basically, by uh, the exchange of the regular shekel to the temple shekel. Why do I tell you all of this? And I'm telling you all of this in the context of the fact that Jesus has just looked for breakfast the day before, he has just been on the top of the hill. Matthew records him saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I wish you had come to me. I would have gathered you to myself like a hen gathers her chickens, but you would not. And he cried. Mark doesn't go into those details, but he says, look at the chronology. He is on the top of the hill. He is doing the Messiah thing. The next day he looks for breakfast in a fig tree, very symbolic. There's none. It's just leaves. And now he is in the house of God. The temple that is dedicated to the worship of the one true creator God. And in the section that is designated for visitors, there are sheep and doves and money changers. Well, Jesus, Jesus is God. Jesus has a father who is in heaven and at that moment, he cannot take it anymore. He's been in this place many times and he has seen this happen. And so he starts going through the market, overturning tables. Money going everywhere. Sheep going places. Doves being set free. And he stands there and they don't stop him. Matthew records that he, that he makes a whip. How many of you come from Africa? I knew you didn't. So I can tell you this because I come from Africa. When you see an African chief, what does he hold in his hand? Looks like what you guys think is a fly swatter, right? It's usually the tail of an animal. It may be looking a little bit like a whip. But it is the African version of the diadem that sits in the Tower of London that the Queen of England owns. When she holds that diadem, that thing that looks like a mace, like a, a club, this is part of her regal regalia. The African kings have the same thing. Jesus makes himself a whip because he is not going to whip people, he is assuming his proper place as king. And he is saying, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Don't think that you can do this religious thing and shut some people out of it. 
Don't think that you can do this religious thing and make it hard for people to find me. Now the money changers have left. They've run away in terror. There's a lady called Ellen White. She comments on this and says that divinity flashed through humanity. For that split second, those money changers saw the glorified Jesus. And it completely terrified them. As it will do on the day when he comes again. If you are not connected to him, if you do not expect him, it will be the most terrifying day this world has ever seen when Jesus comes again glorified, not hidden behind human flesh, but shining as bright as the sun. Ah, I look forward to that day. I don't know about you, but he is my king, and I can't wait for him to come back like that with the zillions of angels behind him, coming like paratroopers, like my grandfather used to say, to rescue those who want to live with him forever and ever. And it's because of this that he set up this whole system that had a temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to teach the whole world how he was going to do things to save people. That's why he did it. And over the years, over the years, the, 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 the religious cultus, that's the proper word, had developed into something that made it not easy for people to come to God, but hard for people to come to God. This is ours. <laughs> we are the Israelites. Sucks for you that you're not. Now, if you go through these huge, big rituals and you, you know, become an Israelite, we'll accept you, but uh, you still have to sit over there. You can imagine that as, as a pastor in this day and age, I, I can't help but make some, some comparisons. I don't want to. But the fact is I'm a pastor of a Christian church that, that claims, uh, among other things, to be the remnant. Just wrap your mind around that one. Maybe you didn't want to come to church and think about that. But uh, that's a claim that the Seventh-day Adventist Church makes. I like to think we have a remnant message. We have like the last message for a dying world. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. But I think there are, there are three things that we can learn further in, in the book of Mark. So if you, have, if you have your Mark open, you can look at... Mark chapter 11, verse 22. How is it? This is, these are going to be three things, three things that we can look at that can help us not be the same as the people that Jesus found on that day when he went to church. Would you like that? I, that's what I want. I can tell you right now, I do not want it to be difficult for people to find Jesus in this church. I don't want it to be difficult for people to find Jesus when they come around me. Now, if you want to make that promise to Jesus today, I encourage you to do so. It's a simple prayer. Jesus, please send the Holy Spirit to in infiltrate my life so that everything that I do and say will be making it easy for people to see Jesus and not me. It's a simple prayer. But I'm telling you, it has, it has huge consequences. Because you see, in, in, in 11 verse 22, uh, Mark says, have faith in God. 
If we don't want to be those kinds of people that Jesus found on that day when he opened, now here's, watch the analogy, when he opened the leaves up and found no figs. Do you see the comparison now? When he went to church and he looked for God and all he found was sheep and doves. I hope, I hope you're awake for this because let me tell you, I don't, I don't want to be this kind of people. I'm just telling you now. Have faith in God. Jesus says, the just shall live by faith. Number two, verse 28. This is something I prayed about this morning in our prayer. I hope you took notice. Because Jesus has some very specific things to say on this issue. Forgive. Forgive, my friends. Forgive so that you may be forgiven. Jesus says that if you come to the temple and you are asking God for forgiveness, there's a, a one thing you need to do first. And that is to find the person that you need to ask forgiveness of. And go to that person and make it right. Now, when I came, uh, Brother Milt said that he was wanting to do communion sometime. And I want you to know that in the Adventist church, we like to do this regularly. And here's one of the biggest reasons, my friends. Here's one of the biggest reasons. So this will make sure that you stay for a foot washing next time. <laughs> and I know some of you don't like feet. And I, to I totally get that. My, my daughter doesn't like feet, but... <laughs> You know, when you are there with just one person, say it was me and John, I, I, get, I, get the chance, I get the chance to pray with John, to pray for John, to ask God on behalf of John, and then he gets the chance to do the same for me. If you don't come to foot washing... Forget the, forget the foot washing piece. That's, that's the service orientation. And I know, I know you guys are working real hard with that. But the biggest piece of the foot washing moment for me that I feel people lose out on when they don't come to that is that they don't have the opportunity to pray for someone else. They don't have the opportunity to be Jesus for someone else. And then have someone else be Jesus for them. Because you see, this church teaches the priesthood of all believers. My house, Jesus says, will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so when we practice foot washing and it becomes this opportunity when we have the chance to make it right. We have the chance to lift somebody else up. As Paul says, don't for forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Tell your friends who aren't coming to church. You know what? Here's what my pastor friend said to me last night. Church is not virtual. Yes, I'm going to say that to you who are watching. <laughs> All right? You can't get this on the TV. And the biggest part of being here today is that you'll be able to pray for somebody. And somebody else might be able to pray for you. So be looking around. Ask Jesus who he wants you to talk to today. And if they're not here, call them up this afternoon. And say, Jesus told me to talk to you. And to just tell you how much he loves you. And if there's somebody who you have something against, the Bible says here in the, the 11th chapter of Mark, verse 28, find that person and forgive, forgive that person. Now I know it's hard. It's really hard. But God says, in order to be forgiven, you must forgive. Third and last, you've heard me say it several times already, verse 17 said, all nations, right? Well, so does John 3.16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world. All. 
So if I had three words for you that you could maybe hang in your mind about this whole situation is have faith, forgive, and remember it's about all. It's not about some. It's about all. This, this congregation, I, I pray, will be about all. That we congregate together because we have a God who said, I have come into this world that this world might be saved. There is nothing that you have done that is beyond him, my friends. So tell your, tell your friends who might be feeling guilty for some reason that, that, that maybe the church has put on them, some tradition that they are feeling guilty for uh, not keeping Tell them, just come. Just come and be here. Let's pray together. Let's, let's sing together. I, I, I don't know if you noticed, most of the songs we sang today were prayers. I, I hope you were praying those prayers as a, at least as you read the songs. You were praying prayers to the God of the universe, asking Him to make you one of the all. You want to be one of the all? Yeah, I thought you did. I, I want to be one of the all, you see, because Jesus came into this world to save those who had gone away from him in his family. And he said, I've come to get you all back. And so here we sit on a Sabbath morning. Yes, the seventh day. Yes, it's very controversial. It's difficult to do it on a, on a Saturday because there are so many other things you could be doing. So I want to thank you for saying yes to Jesus, for saying yes to this moment. I know we have services at a weird time, and yeah, um, it was all because of the cows. <laughs> they had to be milked first. Otherwise, maybe we would have services at you know 9.30 and be done and let you have the rest. Of no, we gather together now because we, we have the opportunity to praise Jesus. We have the opportunity to lift each other up. There'll be a quiz later on. And this will be the question. Why do you come to church? And those will be the answers I'm looking for. Because you come here to praise God. And you come here to lift up someone else to Jesus. Can't do that on the TV. Thank you, Doug Batchelor. Love you. Can't do that on the, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't. So thank you so much for coming here and making the church real, giving it a face, giving it a smell, okay? It's, it, it, it's great to be human. It's great to be part of God's family and to know that he came for us all and that he wants to communicate with us. That's called prayer. And that he makes certain places. He puts it in the hearts of people back in the 60s. Milt, when did we buy this chicken farm? Can't remember. 40 plus years ago, somebody bought this piece of property and put a church on it. Because they said this could be a place where people could come on the seventh day and worship God and lift other people up. Thank you. Amen.